and De Niro was so sinister. Very. And DiCaprio was such a useful idiot. Very much and, so. And, and it, it hurts. It his hurts. wife was such a sincere mm -hmm. lady. Imagine 400 years of not having any rights but being treated as a savage on your own land and you don't own it. This is very significant. Hello, welcome to The Real Generation Gap. My name is Shane Schuldmeyer. And I'm Fred Satilli. And today we are reviewing Killers of the Flower Moon. So Fred, what were your initial thoughts after seeing this movie? It's three and a half hours long. It was a long movie. It was a long movie, but I couldn't have cut a minute. Yeah. I couldn't have cut a minute out of that. Everything that was in there was very, very necessary. Mm -hmm. And as I said in the intro, it's a very, very complex story. In fact, there was much more to the story mm -hmm. than in the movie. And De Niro was so sinister. Very. And DiCaprio was such a useful idiot. Very much and, so. And, and it, it hurts. It his hurts. wife was such a sincere mm -hmm. lady, mm -hmm. you know? And th those three personalities, that's matches of gasoline. That's a, that's a formula for abuse. Mm -hmm. And boy, did they abuse. And that's what I really liked about this movie. I'm so used to seeing Leo be the hero. Be, other than Wolf of Wall Street, that's like the scummiest I've ever seen him be, you know? But even in that, you like love him. Absolutely. But uh, I'm so used to seeing him be like the nice guy, the hero. But um, in this movie, you really like love, hate him, you know? He's slowly hurt, hurting um, Lily, or I'm sorry, Molly. And... Uh, he, but, you but can he, you can see it in him. He doesn't really 100% know he's hurting her, and he doesn't really want to be doing it, but he just trusts his uncle. And it the way he portrays that is just, it's so good. It's a masterpiece. Yeah. It really is. He, he brings out every single one of those inner conflicts that you could possibly have. He's got to do something that he knows is wrong. He's justifying it in his own mind. That aspect of the movie is phenomenal, the relationship mm -hmm. part. Now, the overarching story is basically this is what happened. The federal government granted this land to these poor indigenous people, and the land was bad land. Mm -hmm. You couldn't do anything with it. It was yeah. an insult. They, they, that, they thought they were... Uh, Getting over on yeah, them. Yeah, yeah, exactly. yeah, exactly. It was really a nasty thing to do. Mm -hmm. the, the indigenous peoples, they accepted that this was theirs. And they, it was pretty good of them to accept it because it was not great. It was like, all right, you're giving us the worst land? It, it's our land. We'll, we'll make good with it. Well, then they discovered the oil there. Now, people wanted to get that oil. Yeah, and I mean, even in the movie, I don't know if it's that way in the book, but in the movie, there's a scene where... Leo's like pulling up a car or something and all the the, the lady uh, Native Americans they're talking and they're like he just wants you for her money and sh or something like that and she's like of course he wants my money but he loves me too or so you know and that's it's really painful because you know she's so in love and uh, right there's so much greed and betrayal involved she and... can't believe that he's gonna betray her because she yeah. doesn't have a betrayal bone in her body yeah she couldn't betray anybody yeah and I think they're like he's a snake and she's like, no, he's a, a fox, or I forgot what she says he is. Right. But, uh, you know, it's, it's pretty sad. But he was under the thumb of his uncle. Yeah. And he, he had no way out. So at that time, th these indigenous people wanted justice, and they went to Washington, D.C., and they weren't getting it. But J. Edgar Hoover was creating the FBI at that time. And so he, the, the FBI, the, the fledgling FBI, was the one that went in, and their, their agents were killed. Mm -hmm. These, yeah. Nobody was kidding around here. This was big money. And they, they managed to get agents in there and figure this out. And it was a, a big win for J. Edgar Hoover. And another thing not mentioned in the movie, but once again, as you said, just glossed over, the president at that time was Calvin Coolidge. And he had tremendous sympathy for these people. And during his administration is when they were made into American citizens. Now, there's good things about that and not good things about that, but either You're way... You're about the Native Americans were made into... They citizens. were made into... He wanted to make them into American citizens so that they would have the privileges and protection, not the rights, because rights are God-given, but that they would have the privileges and protection that a normal citizen would have. Mm -hmm. It was done in, in a good spirit and a good heart. He wasn't trying to exploit them, but this all happened at that time. It was just after World War One. A great many of these uh, tribe members had fought in the war, and they deserved recognition mission and credit for their contribution to our nation. And so all this was going on. But um, what, what they did in murdering all these people and in upsetting their society and blowing up their buildings and everything was 
reprehensible at a level that most people don't even want to recognize. We all know that people are exploited all over the world. Every day. All over the world. There's all kind of exploitations and it's always reprehensible. The soundtrack of this movie was by Robbie Robertson. Okay, yeah. This guy is 60 years of music production. He's a guy from the 50s and he, his lifetime, Martin Scorsese has used him to create scores in the past and he he had a tremendous library, him and uh, Bob DeBear height that had a, a tremendous library of the first original recordings of music in America, like these real old 78s and everything that were used in juke joints and stuff okay. like that. So he's the most probably the most authentic, real American, you know, a, a natural American, American only music that there could be. The instrumentation, the music in this movie was fantastic for three and a it half awesome. hours. The it was bottleneck awesome. guitar work it was, was so spooky. Good. It was scary, spooky guitar playing. Yeah and just amazing. And I think you had mentioned to me something like, um, you love when you watch a movie and you don't, it doesn't draw your, it's so good, it fits perfectly you're not like overly drawn to the music subliminal yeah exactly this movie didn't have a lot of talking yeah so the music added a real lot of drama to it and then just to just to really almost poetically robbie robertson passed away two months before this movie oh, came wow. out so this is really of his whole life like the final masterpiece the pinnacle of his success awesome. and everything as far as i'm concerned I, I was never really a big fan of him you know growing up or anything i was just like a heavy rocker but but so like uh, what's some of the stuff he's done well his original band was called the band Okay. And they had a bunch of hits, you know, Cripple Creek and that. And, yeah. and, and uh, he went on from there to be a producer. So the band did well, and he created a name for himself and everything. But after that, he had a studio and thousands of artists recorded stuff there. And he just knew what he was doing, just knew how to produce good stuff. And the stuff he produced for this movie was just so perfect. That's really cool. Yeah. That's really cool. And so, yeah, like, like we said, the cast is amazing. The music production was amazing. And I don't know if you knew this, but the screenwriter also wrote Forrest Gump and Dune. And that, yeah, that was Eric Roth. Right. Um, which, I, I, like I was saying, like the whole crew for this was awesome. So we had Eric Roth, who was the screenwriter, Forrest Gump, Dune. Oh, there you go. Forrest Gump. Eh, Dune. I love Dune. I Forrest almost, Gump's good. It's just I, dated a little bit, but yeah. Yeah. Well, I read the original, you know, okay, and yeah. I, I was thrilled when they when they finally made a movie because Otto Preminger said that you could never make Dune. Mm -hmm. He read the book and he goes, no one could ever make this movie. Yeah. Did you like Dune? It, yes, I'm, I was a big fan and Dune's still am. Cool. Yeah, and then uh, the yeah, cinema... Paul Atreides, you know. Yeah, the <laughs> cinematographer was Rodrigo Prieto. I mm -hmm. hope I said that right. Yeah. And he did The Wolf of Wall Street and The Irishman. Wolf of Wall Street's in like my top five. I love that movie. Another Martin Scorsese movie too. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, both those are Martin Scorsese movies. So it was just a really good cast and crew for this movie. And, and then on top of that, the setting was so perfect. Oh, yeah. The setting was completely Absolutely. authentic. They met with the Osage people. They got their approval. They got their respect. Robert De Niro and Leo both learned to speak Osage or speak their, their language. It's not called Osage. Yeah, to, but to be able to pronounce it cleanly be, and authentically. Yeah. So yeah, you know, the cast, the crew was amazing. But not only that, like... This movie was really focused on being authentic and having the approval of the Osage people. Um, you know, they shot in Oklahoma. They shot on, like, where these events took place. I saw some pictures um, where one of the sisters was the, the sister who was murdered in the creek. Oh. They, they actually shot in the creek, which is crazy. Um, I mean, it's not crazy. It's awesome. But, like, you don't really think to do that, you know? So they totally were aiming to get the respect and the approval of the Osage people, and I think that's amazing. I think that's awesome. Do you think the movie would have performed, even been close to the same, had they just said, you know, let's just write this script. We don't need their approval. Leo and Robert De Niro both learned the, the native language. Do you think it would perform as well, do as well, had it not had that much perception for the for the culture? Well, because I only saw it the only way I could see it, mm -hmm. and because I 100% bought everything, I, I don't think it could have been better done any other way. Yeah. I think they really did a good job. And another part of that, with the authenticity, for me as a car guy, did you see all those models? That was cool. Keys? That was the, cool. The cars they had, and they didn't care. They trashed them. Yeah. You know, something that would be an incredible antique now. It was like, eh, take it, drive it over the, you know, the terrain and through the, ra yeah. the river and whatever, shoot it up. Or, yeah. you know, they gave each other cars like the drop of a hat and that yeah. kind of a thing. And uh, There was even a scene where they were buying cars, wasn't there? 
Yeah, the one guy, the, they were so rich that the car salesman wanted very badly to make the sale. He's telling him, I have a family, I need the commission. And the guy says, well, give me one in every collar. Yeah. And he's, oh, thank and you. And that, that you. really played into just, you know, showing the, the trust between the two cultures and like emphasizing the betrayal that would eventually happen. Yeah. The cars were cool, though. The cars were very cool. And, and it was that way with everything, the clothing. I, that's why I wore my Buffalo Soldier outfit. <laughs> Very you know, nice. To, to it kind of yeah. honor, honor the, the period there. Yeah, every aspect of this thing for three and a half hours to hold your attention that way, mm -hmm. there was nothing you could cut. And another kind of a big player in the movie that I didn't really even put in my notes and I'm just kind of thinking of right now was insulin. You know, that was something new that developed and diabetes was like a big issue um there's even a scene where the he, the doctor's telling uh molly that you can't you can't eat like the white man right your condition's gonna get worse i don't know too much about the development of insulin but since it came out around your time um, <laughs> i was wondering if you had you know anything you could add to that yeah you know when you're eating dinosaurs you yeah. know, you no the indigenous people had a zero sugar diet now not only are they being given sugar but they're given unlimited alcohol yeah which brings on diabetes so they, they they were, they were a nation of people who had no resistance to this. They weren't brought up. Well, suddenly, mm -hmm. they had these giant blood sugar spikes and everything. So naturally, they had blood sugar diseases. Mm -hmm. And they, so they start injecting them. Well, they were also injecting them with heroin along with it, and they're killing them that way. Yeah. So here, the medicine is killing you. They're just, oh, God. Human beings are terrible to other human yeah. beings. That, that, that was right. another part of the betrayal right there, too. You, right. know, you trust your doctor. Your doctor's supposed to look out for you no matter what. They, they have the oath. And you know, the, the cliche is you don't give whiskey to an Indian, right? Mm -hmm. and, and the Asian people, who the indigenous people are the, you know, genetically linked Migrated. to, yeah. yeah, they also don't have a big tolerance for alcohol. Oh, yeah. So this was a, a really bad thing They that they brought in the alcohol, they brought in all this sugar. Mm -hmm. Alcohol and depression were a little bit a, a, a player in the movie too. A absolutely. Yeah. They, they were all having a lot of emotional trouble because they were smashed, you know, yeah. and they, they couldn't. They, they called it the melancholy, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah, the melancholy. When the tribe started to acquire all this wealth, they were given conservators mm -hmm. because the, these people didn't have any concept of this kind of wealth. And so the, these conservators, they were stealing from them too. They were, it was like, if you want your money, you're going to give me 10%, 20%, 50%, whatever it was. So they had to deal with these ruthless conservators, these people connected to the banks. And this, once again, is the treaty, Washington, D.C., law. They were just taking money from them any way they could, even if they had to kill them. They were taking it every way they could and abusing them, every, disabling them in any way they could. That's so sad. It's, it, it's so reprehensible. It's, it's uh, thank God somebody made the movie. Yeah. So that's our review on Killers of the Flower Moon. What, what do you think, Fred? What do you give it? Couldn't give it anything but a 10. 10? Like, you know, a 10 plus, yeah. Honestly, I'm up there. I loved it. I'm, I'm going 10 too, because mm -hmm. for three and a half hours long, to keep me loving it, that's hard. And I loved it. Two tens. I think that's our first perfect score, huh? I, I'm not sure, but it certainly earned it. It cool. certainly earned it. So we loved it, but we also had the luxury of talking to a Native American and getting his perspective on the movie. And uh, let's check that out. Larison Many Goats. Larison is here to give us really good insight into Native American culture. We're talking about the movie, Killers of the Flower Moon, and he's quite an expert on that area of the world and those tribes. So... Larison, it's really an honor to meet you. Now, I know that this movie was really good on depicting the culture of the Osage Nation. And I want you to tell us some of the details of did to make this really authentic. The actors, the female actors in the, the movie, the women were very modest. So they are uh, very conservative. And uh, when they always, when they spoke, uh, it was like they speaking the truth. Um, a lot of the, the set that was in place, the regalia that they showed, and the authenticity of uh, the language they were speaking that was what made this movie great. If the traditions didn't exist, this movie would be just another another movie. I know this was actually filmed at an authentic location, right? Tell us everything about that. Correct. Uh, the location that they showed was out on a ranch and the actual city of Tulsa itself. And a lot of the residents verified and confirmed that the, the locations uh, of the film. And the Osage Nation still resides there? The Osage Nations are still there. Uh, we interviewed quite a few of them. Uh, some of the leadership that was there and uh, some of the residents that were there, they came in their regalias and 
to the movie screen. You interviewed a few uh, natives. How how is the movie being received by everyone, and uh, what are the comments like? The reaction I got from uh, the movie screen was a lot of people were uh, still in uh, shock. Uh, they were on impressed, especially the language I was using in uh, in the movie. Leonardo DiCaprio, he he got it on point because he he had at least a minute little over a minute of speaking Osage language. And he had a conversation going with the Osage people, especially with his wife in the movie. It was a pretty impressive. And I think this movie would actually win more awards than The Last of the Mohicans or Geronimo. So that's a, the type of impression I got when the, uh, everyone came out of the movie theater. And, and it's quite incredible because the story literally took three and a half hours to tell and I watched the three and a half hours and I wouldn't have cut a minute. Did you feel the same way? Or did you feel that there was even more to the story? There is more to the story because a lot of people don't understand the native uh, culture, the actual indigenous population that were there. Um, the Osage language actually has a written, that's probably one of the reasons they were uh, masters of negotiating with the oil companies and, and got themselves in a wealthy situation. Well, I just wanted you to elaborate on the, you know, the language. I know that Leonardo DiCaprio did go to great lengths to do the pronunciations correctly. Yes, uh, he spoke the language clearly. He had a conversation going. It's not, it's not often you see another uh, nationality speaking your language. The original people would be impressed with it. With natives, once you speak, start speaking that language, you're actually become closer. And it's near family. It's a better relationship, more comfortable relationship. Had you heard of this story, this, you know, what what had happened in uh, Oklahoma prior to the book or the movie? I didn't read the book at all. I just heard about it through uh, our interviews here in Texas Insider. Everyone was pointing to this movie screening up in Tulsa, and I started to research it. They We called them up, see if we could get our, uh, ourselves invited, and uh, that's how we got into it. Before going there, I actually watched the movie to see what it was really about. I had, I had no idea about the story with the Osage people and the oil companies. I've never heard American Indians be in a wealthy situation. So it was very that they would negotiate with the U.S. government and actually have mineral rights to their land. And having a reverse uh, situation where Native Americans are wealthy and then you have uh, other nationalities as your workers. So you have uh, escorts, you have security, and, and you have the town, the town is yours. Imagine uh, uh, Native Americans owning a town and being rich, and you own the majority of, of the, the bars and the dealerships. The market there is yours. It was a very interesting way Osage people had, had their wealth. It's true. The movie opens with Leonardo DiCaprio saying, who owns all this land? And the guy driving the car said, oh, this is all my land. Right. Uh, during that time was uh, World War One when those uh, the things that were going on with Osage. And majority of Native Americans, the population had priests. So they had to create a census. And conquerors are now owning this land. It was probably very strange for him to actually say, you know what, uh, this is my land. This is, this is my territory an actual Native American driving you around saying that this is my land and they're treating you like a, a, a really good guest. Well, one of the things that you said in our conversation before that I don't think anybody, I certainly was not aware of it, how many Indian nations are there on the land here? In the United States, there are at least 575 uh, recognized tribes the last time I looked, federally recognized tribes. That, that is a staggering number. I had no idea. I would have thought 12. And I live in California where we have, you know, tribal casinos and tribal land and that kind of thing. I had no idea that there were that many recognized tribes here in America. There's also tribes that are included up in Alaska, too. We still have tribes up there, and they all actually have a lot of minerals and uh, some, on some still some on their property, on the areas that they live in. What I can say is about this movie is, the, the traditions in the movie were uh, on point. The, the terrain on it was on point. The, the set was on point. But this movie should generalize all Native Americans. Every Native American 
is different. For like where I grew up, there's a lot of desert. There's a lot of trees. There's a lot of uh, land there. I think well, we're all still here. All Native Americans are still here. I still speak my language. But it is the traditions that the traditions and the culture and the principles, as long as they're still there, it will continue on generations and generations. So traditions are very important. That's This is what made the movie uh, Killers of the Flower Moon. If traditions were not all, like I said, it would be just another. And, and uh, people actually have to realize, like, this is just not for Native Americans. It's all, every everyone around the world. Traditions are important. Culture is Everything you do every day is important. That's what they displayed in this movie, where the women would go out and pray early. They would talk among each other as a council. And also, the Osage people, the head rights, uh, no longer exist. There, there is now a uh, mineral council. So that's one of the things that the, it wasn't really explained in the movie, the head rights. So if people look it up. There's not many of them left, but there's only mineral councils. Just out of curiosity, since you do speak your language, how do you greet people in your Native American language? Oh, uh, we greet them uh, like yate in Navajo. It means all is well. It uh, it actually means a blessing, like everything is well with you, with me. It's like a relationship. It's kind of the spirit of aloha, isn't it? <laughs> a little bit. Yeah. Um, I have a question about the language. Are, are most Native American languages similar or would you say they're more different or, or like is there similarities between them or are they all very different and um unique to themselves the languages they're all different if you think about world war ii world war one each tribe was involved in each war the hopis were there navajo uh osage was there choctaw was there those languages were used to fight another country that wanted to take the United States. They wanted to, because of communism, they wanted to take uh, the United States. So the American Indians came in and they, the, the U.S. government used those resources to fight back and use these languages in a, in a secret language. Because of the, some of these secrets, they weren't revealed until 50 years later, 70 years later, and finally they made it uh, revealed it, make it, uh, took it out of the uh, unsecret. So I can't remember the word for it, but there's no was no longer secret. So the government told these soldiers, don't speak about the war, don't speak about what you've done, but you did great things for the United States, you did great things for America and for your people. So they kept these secrets to themselves very long time until more recently they all came out and finally the reward the honor finally came out after years and years or decades of just holding it in so majority of these soldiers were their elder in the elder 70s and 80s imagine if you were 20 years old 18 years old fighting but then they tell you don't talk this is secret you someone might capture you Somewhere in the United States, we don't. Someone we might have a hidden cell here that will capture your language and then discover it and use it. That's how significant and different the languages are in the United States. How do you feel the uh, representation of Native American actors in the film were? I'm not sure if they were all from the Osage tribe or not. Maybe you know. Um, and specifically, uh, Lily Gladstone. How do you how do you think it was all represented? I think Lily Gladstone did a great job, just being conservative. Being a, a Native American, uh, she perceived herself like one of my uh, aunties, my cousin sisters back in the day. And uh, that's the modesty among elders back then. And that's what, you know, was mysterious about them. But it was warm. Uh, it was welcoming. So that's how they, they, they showed Lily Gladstone. And that was very, very significant to me. Yeah, she was a very dignified lady, wasn't she? Right. That was very awesome. Do you believe that the the message of the movie is relevant today? It's still relevant today because a lot of federal Indian reservations are not actually owned by American. They are federal reservations. Back home on Navajo Nation, right, they had minerals, but they still had to fight for what's underneath the soil. And the minerals are not theirs, but they have to have something in trade for it. So it's continuous. Even in Alaska, 
the current administration put money out there, millions and millions of dollars, so they can move and relocate people from their homes into the cities. So they're pushing these indigenous people and Native Americans out by manipulating, by giving them money and off their land into the cities. This is happening in Alaska. So the Department of Interior is helping with that situation. And people don't understand that this is actual manipulation by the government and by the Department of Interior. You may see a lot of money, but money is only short, short term. But the land is forever. So as long as you have your traditions and principles, the land will continue to be there. But the Department of Interior and the situation with these mineral rights, it, it, it makes it short. People are getting short-sighted by it. I'm sure in countries all over the world, this same, this same, you know, mineral grab and relocation of indigenous population is taking place. So as we watch this movie, we realize that throughout the world, South America, Africa, places like that, uh, certainly in the Indonesian archipelago, this kind of stuff has taken place. I remember the oil in East Timor and what a bloody situation that was. So there's a lot to take to heart in the movie, Killers of the Flower Moon. Uh, I had someone else to add to it. In the movie, you, you see uh, Osage people have all these rights. So other tribes during that time didn't have rights. So they had no voice. And because of they had no voice, they didn't have the power to do much. Like situations where American Indians were being pushed off the land, so were their children being taken also. So they couldn't follow some of their children that went to were pushed off the reservations to forties and whatever schools that they went to, uh, Catholic churches or actual government schools or I don't think they even had state schools back then yet, but they had no rights. They had no rights. The children had no rights and they had no voice. So whatever was going on in those schools and off the reservation, the, the Amer American Indian people were stuck on the reservation. They couldn't chase after their kids. That was another thing that it doesn't show anything, but they don't see that Native Americans had no rights until more recently. And they, had, they didn't have much voice until more recent. So imagine 400 years of not having any rights, but being treated as a savage on your own land and you don't own it. This is very significant, Sage movie. Yeah, I think in the movie, they even show a little bit of that by um, when they go to the bank, they have to have someone represent them, right? So they can't make their own decisions with their money. Someone needed to make those decisions or help them make those decisions. Um, that was kind of uh, the same idea, correct? That's correct. The people then, they didn't understand fraud because Native Americans, they, they're modest, they speak the truth, and they're puzzled by these little interests here and there. Like, there's a, a backstory to it, to like, why, why can't I have my money? This is my money. You're taking my land, my oil, and now a bank is holding my money. So why do I need to verify that who I am? Because of these, these Native Americans didn't really have rights. They didn't have certificates. They didn't have like licenses. They didn't have ID cards back then. To verify something, you have to go to your local office. And usually it's a, uh, a government office and the, the government is backed up because they need interpreters for these Native Americans. So there's a lot of situations there that, you know what, the banks are doing whatever they want to do, add interest, hold your money, and, and just just so they can keep the money. So, so overall, would you say the movie's pretty authentic? Do you have any, any discrepancies with it? I think the movie is authentic comparing to all the other movies that were up and out there, like The Last of the Mohicans, Geronimo. They're very, very, uh, it, w it was very unique. It was authentic. And I'm not sure if you're a big movie guy, but one out of 10, what would you give this movie? One out of 10, I, I give it a 10. It has a, a lot of stuff that characters about Native Americans, their, uh, how they present themselves and how their, their leadership works, their councils. It mentions all of that. And they also talk about their traditions and then they, they pray when they pray they were praying out in the morning they're talking about the certain prayers and how they were inviting they, the way the way they, the way they uh presented themselves to the other characters and actually were inviting welcome it's not the regular 
old school black and white movie where Native Americans were treated as savages and, and they were treated as the enemy. But Marlon Brando changed all that not too long ago. I, I, this, I, uh, I give this a 10. Larson, we were very honored to have this interview with you. We really appreciate it. We'll let you go. Maybe we'll see you again in another issue such as this. Thanks again. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. As always, guys, make sure to like, comment, subscribe. Let us know what you guys think of this movie. Is it the best Martin Scorsese movie? Is it the worst? Is it in between? Do you think this movie accurately portrayed the Native American culture, the Osage people? Um, and thank you for watching, guys. Until the next one, see you there.